fall, but it's good to be gathered together here in the chapel and uh, to all of those that are joining us via the live stream. We're so glad that you're here and that you're uh, able to connect with us in this way. As you know, this semester we've been studying the Apostles' Creed, and we have a few more chapels to go, and we look today at the communion of the saints, and we're thankful that Dr. Kevin Van Hooser is here to lead us in receiving that portion of the creed and hearing from God's word. Thank you to all of you for what you do on campus and off campus to enable us to continue in our important work here. We're so grateful that God has demonstrated his faithfulness toward us in this difficult and challenging season. We do not take the individual efforts of all of you for granted. So thank you for what you're doing. Uh, as we come together today to hear God's word and to celebrate his goodness and faithfulness to us, let's begin uh, with this call to worship from the Psalms. If you're able, please stand with me and hear our call to worship from Psalm 133. I invite you to hear these words and consider them, to meditate upon them. The psalmist says, Behold, how good and pleasant it is when brothers and sisters dwell in unity. It is like the precious oil on the head, running down on the beard, on the beard of Aaron, running down on the collar of his robes. It is like the dew of Hermon, which falls on the mountains of Zion. For there the Lord has commanded the blessing, life forevermore. Continuing in Psalm 134, come, bless the Lord, all you servants of the Lord who stand by night in the house of the Lord. Lift up your hands to the holy place and bless the Lord. May the Lord bless you from Zion, he who made heaven and earth. Let's worship this Lord today. Let's sing. Rejoice in the Lord always and again I say. Again I say rejoice in the Lord always and again I say, again I say. Bless the Lord, come bless the Lord, draw me to worship Christ the Lord, and bless His name, His holy name, declaring He is good. Oh, that man would praise Him, oh, that man would praise Him, rejoice in the Lord always, and again I say, Again I say rejoice in the Lord always and again I say again I say rejoice come bless the Lord come bless the Lord do near to worship Christ the Lord and bless his name his holy name declaring his good oh that man would pray Oh, that man would praise him, rejoice in the Lord always. And again I say, again I say, rejoice in the Lord always. And again I say, again I say, rejoice in the Lord always. And again I say, again I say, rejoice. In the Lord always, and again I say, and again I say, and again I say, and again I say, rejoice. Oh, 
Oh, how good it is. Oh, how good it is when the family of God dwells together in spirit, in faith and unity, where the bonds of peace, of acceptance and love are the fruit of His presence here among us. So with one voice we'll sing to the Lord, and with one heart we'll live out His Word till the whole earth sees the redeemed has come, for He dwells in the presence of His people.
Let's confess together our common faith with the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended to heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and life everlasting. Amen. Please join me in prayer. O Lord, our God, you who are almighty and all-knowing, you see our weary souls, the limp in our step. Strengthen us, we ask. You who are slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love, you hear the cries of our heart. Comfort us, we ask. You who are the light and life of the world, you remain present with us in the midst of of darkness and confusion. Give us eyes to see, we ask. Your word is life, light to our feet. May it guide us. And we, your church, are called to be a city on a hill, a holy nation. In these trying times, we pray for your church, that we might be a beacon to a weary world. Those who testify to the light, who demonstrate a hope commensurate with our imperishable inheritance. May we not conform to the world, to its patterns of life, its hopes and ambitions, but rather might we be transformed by the power of your gospel in Christ and through your spirit. One body, one head, one spirit, and one hope. Be with us now, we ask. Bless the lips of your servant, Kevin, that he might minister your word, and bless also the ears and hearts of us, your people, that we might be edified and strengthened by your sustaining word. We ask these things in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Today's scriptural reading is found in Ephesians chapter 2 verses 4 to 22, and 1 Peter um, chapter 2, verses 9 and 10. Let's read from Ephesians chapter 2. But because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ even when we were dead in transgressions. It is by his grace you have been saved. And God raised us up with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus. In order that in the coming ages he might show the incomparable riches of his grace expressed in his kindness to us in Christ Jesus. For it is by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not from yourselves, it is the gift of God. Now by, not by works so that no one can boast. For we are God's handiwork, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. Therefore, remember that formerly you who are Gentiles by birth and called uncircumcised by those who call themselves the circumcision, which is done in the body by human hands, remember that at that time you were separate from Christ excluded from citizenship in Israel and foreigners to the covenants of the promise, without hope and without God in the world. But now in Christ Jesus, you who once were far away have been brought near by the blood of Christ. For he himself is our peace, who has made the two groups one and has destroyed the barrier, the dividing wall of hostility, by setting aside his flesh by setting aside in his flesh the law with its commands and regulations. 
His purpose was to create in himself one new humanity out of the two, thus making peace. And in one body to reconcile both of them to God through the cross, by which he put to death their hostility. He came and preached peace to you who were far away and peace to those who were near. For through him we both have access to the Father by one spirit. Consequently, you are no longer foreigners and strangers, but fellow citizens with God's people and also members of his household. Built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets with Christ Jesus himself as the chief cornerstone. In him, the whole building is joined together and rises to become a holy temple in the Lord. And in him, you two are being built together to become a dwelling in which God lives by his spirit. Now turn um, to 1 Peter 2, verses 9 and 10. But you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession, that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. Once you were not a people, but now you are the people of God. Once you, are not, you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. This is the word of the Lord. I believe in the Holy Catholic Church and the communion of saints. Help mine unbelief. Unbelief, yes, because of all the lines in the Apostles' Creed, this one may be the hardest to confess for the simple reason that it refers to something we all experience. We've seen firsthand the denominational divisions, the worship wars, the moral failings of church leaders. Blessed are those that have seen and yet believe. The creed describes the church as holy and Catholic. Holy means set apart for a divine purpose. Catholic means comprehensive, whole. As to holiness, here in Chicagoland, we've been treated to first uh, front page news stories about lapsed pastors. As to Catholicity, Although Paul speaks of one body with many members, you don't need a degree in church history to know about the many church splits and denominational divisions that belie our confession of church unity. Alas, all too often the church looks more like a dismembered body, the scene of a violent crime. True story. The first time I was asked to speak on ecclesiology here at Trinity, over 30 years ago, was for a required MDiv course. At the time, it was called Ecclesiology and Eschatology. I was in my early 30s, untenured, and the syllabus looked to me like a top 10 list of controversial issues, like jumping into a boiling cauldron of hot water, spiritual gifts, pedo baptism, forms of church government, women's ordination, and oh yes, the little matter of the mode of Christ's presence in the Lord's Supper. I actually asked to be excused from teaching that course, a request granted by my department head, John Feinberg. And then shortly thereafter, like Jonah, I lit out on a ship going to Tarshish. Well, Edinburgh, but same thing. You see, I had a vision problem. I was seeing the church through a sociological lens, dimly. What the church really is, comes into focus only when we view it theologically in relation to the triune God. Viewed through a biblical lens, we see the church for what it truly is, an eschatological and not just an empirical reality. And this is what doctrine does in general. It helps us see things as they truly are in relation to what the Father is doing through the Son in the Spirit in accordance with the scriptures. The reason I didn't want to speak about the church then was because my imagination was too small. It had been taken captive to something other than the scriptures. Well, the Apostles' Creed liberates captive imaginations and trains disciples to think about everything in relation to the God of the gospel 
and the gospel of God. It summarizes the story that shapes Christian identity. The Apostles' Creed trains us to see God, the world, and ourselves in relation to what God has done in Christ. And this is the proper function of doctrine in general, to help form disciples by reminding them of what God has done, is doing, and will do in Jesus Christ. And in doing that, the creed shapes our imaginations so that our thinking and hopefully our living corresponds to the drama of redemption that it celebrates. The doctrine of the church is a vital piece of disciple making. It holds before our minds a picture of who we, the people of God, are. What James says about hearers and doers who see themselves in the mirror of scripture applies to the church too. So what do we learn about the identity of the church when as a communion of saints, we look into the mirror of scripture together? Paul Menier's classic book, Images of the Church in the New Testament, identifies and examines 96 images, major images like people of God, body of Christ, and fellowship of the spirit, as well as minor images like salt of the earth, or Noah's ark, or a loaf of bread. Studying Menier's book is an exercise that replenishes our theological imaginations. It infuses our thinking about the church with a plethora of biblical metaphors and analogies. And each of these images helps us better understand what it means to confess the Holy Catholic Church. It's been said that Ephesians 2 is perhaps the most significant ecclesiological text in the New Testament. Paul here offers a masterclass in the doctrine of the church, thanks largely to several striking images he uses. Where Jesus taught about the kingdom of God through parables, Paul uses pictures to explain how the church is holy, Catholic, and a communion of saints. So think of Ephesians 2 as the ecclesial wing in a Pauline art gallery. Hanging here in this chapter are several masterpieces of ecclesiology. So let's have a closer look. We enter this wing, by the way, under the banner that says, God made us alive together with Christ, verse 5. Paul here coins a three-part Greek term to say what God has done. Soon, the preposition with, zoe, the noun for life, and poeo, the verb to make. Soon zo poison, to make alive together with. This is just the first of three terms Paul invents, all beginning with this same prefix, soon. Made alive with, raised with, seated with. These are the divine acts that establish the communion of saints who've been made alive together with Christ. Now, verses 11 and 12 provide the backdrop for Paul's ecclesiology, pictures of what the Ephesian Christians were before God made them alive together with Christ. And here we see five sorry portraits of what life is like when the Lord designates you not my people. Prior to their conversion, the Ephesians were apart from Christ, excluded from the citizenship of Israel, foreigners to the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. You see, Paul wants his readers to remember that they were formally excluded from God's chosen people with absolutely no chance of obtaining an entry visa. That was then, once dead, now alive in Christ, but with a difference, because Christ on the cross has broken down the hostility that once existed between Jew and Gentile. He's created a new humanity, one new man in place of two, so making peace, as Paul says in verse 15. 
To be sure, there was a people of God before the church. The church exists because of Jesus Christ, yet there is continuity with Israel. One 16th century Lutheran pastor comments, here in this chapter we are taught what the church is, the creation of one new humanity in place of the two. You see, Jews divided humanity into Jews and Gentiles. Paul actually mentions three categories, Jews, Gentiles, and the church of God. Early Christians following Paul sometimes spoke of themselves as a third race, neither Jewish nor Gentile. And Calvin agrees. He says, in Christ, we have become a single race. Christ makes Jew and Greek one by breaking down the dividing wall of hostility. What's that wall made of? Some think Paul's referring to the barrier that prevented Gentiles from entering into the inner court of the temple in Jerusalem. Others think it may refer to the Mosaic law with its stipulations about covenant identity markers like circumcision. That keeps Gentiles out as well. But whatever it was, Christ has overcome it. The unity of the church is not a human achievement. It's a divine act. So it follows, as Paul says, that saints are God's workmanship. And the term he uses here, poema, is often used in the, in the Septuagint to refer to the work of an artisan. But Paul goes on to say that we've been created in Christ Jesus, and there he uses the term that the Septuagint uses for God's creation of the world. The community of sinners was dead and had to be called into existence as a church, a kind of an ex nihilo creation, or maybe better, an in Christo recreation. But in any case, the church is a creation of a new humanity in which racial and ethnic divides are no more. As Paul says in 2 Corinthians 5, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. And what replaces that dividing wall of hostility is the preaching of peace, peaceful coexistence among different ethnic groups. That's part and parcel of the gospel. Any segregation or exclusion of any human group that professes Jesus Christ, any exclusion of that group from full church membership dismembers the church and negates what the church is, this new humanity. Of course, we're not there yet. The church is still a work in progress. Dividing walls remain. One of the feature articles in the November issue of Christianity Today is entitled, When the Pews Are Polarized. In a divided culture and divisive election year, pastors strive for unity in Christ. Polarization over politics makes it seem like partisanship is stronger than the peace of Christ. The article goes on to quote a minister who says that the polarization in his church is so acute that in his church and most churches, uh, you, lean to the le you lean to the left or you lean to the right, and you think that only those on the left or the right, respectively, can be true Christians. Well, brothers and sisters, we deny the reality of the church's one new humanity when we erect new dividing walls, whether they're political, racial, or even doctrinal. Paul produced his picture for such a time as this. We are his workmanship, yet the work of becoming one in Christ continues. The church is both evidence of God's workmanship and an active workshop of new humanity. Workmanship and workshop. That's image 97, if you're keeping score. Um, I'm, I'm a sucker for time travel stories, paradoxes and all. Books and films like Back to the Future, Edge of Tomorrow, The Time Machine, The Time Traveler's Wife, Wrinkle in Time, and just about every other Star Trek episode. 
And this brings me to image number 98, one that Meniere missed. The church as a company of time-traveling witnesses to a once and future grace. You see, Paul says in verse 6 that God has seated us with Christ in the heavenly realms. Jesus has ascended. The flesh of our new humanity is already embodied. And we share now in Christ's exaltation. Calvin says, in Christ, we already possess immortality. We have one foot in the future, as it were. And the eschatological already not yet makes saints into time travelers of a sort. Of course, as Grant Osborne rightly notes, the scene Paul depicts is not the future physical resurrection at the second coming, but a present foretaste of that on a spiritual plane. I like the way Wolfgang Musculus puts it in his 16th century commentary. He writes, therefore, if we are really his members, our hearts commune with him in heaven because he is our head, even though we are still stuck on earth. And he goes on to say that the new life we have in Christ extends to all the elect everywhere and in every age from the beginning of the world to the end. That's what I call Catholicity. But again, we're already not yet there. The church is not the kingdom of God, only its herald and its witness. The kingdom is the future of the church and the church is a company of people who now live oriented to that future. As Pannenberg says in his study of the Apostles' Creed, the church knows itself to be God's community of the end time. The church as end time community. Or perhaps we could say the church is the now time community of end time communion. Witnesses from the future to the future in the present. Uh, next up in our ecclesial art tour, is Paul Meniere's image number 27, a portrait of the saint as fellow citizen. You see, Gentile Christians are no longer strangers and aliens from the commonwealth of Israel because they've become fellow citizens, not of Rome, but of the city of God. This is no earthly city because Paul says in Philippians 3 that our citizenship is in heaven. Now, the Ephesians knew it was no small thing to be a citizen with all the rights and privileges appertaining thereunto. Mere sojourners and resident aliens lacked basic legal privileges, protections, and civil rights. So for Paul to say that his readers were fellow citizens, that was stunning because it's estimated that at the time of the writing of the epistle, only 1% of the roughly 100,000 residents of Ephesus were, in fact, citizens. And here I need to direct your attention to another picture in the gallery on loan from St. Peter. You are a holy nation, a people for God's own possession. The church is a set-apart nation in the midst of other nations. Before they had become a people, the Ephesians were alienated from the commonwealth of Israel. A commonwealth is a political community founded for the common good. Maybe you know the related term, common weal, which reminds us that the particular wealth in view is wellness, well-being. The church is a communion of citizen saints who have in common well-being in Christ. Now citizenship carries privileges and responsibilities. In ancient Athens, education served the purpose of forming citizens who could participate in democracy. Citizens of heaven, likewise, need training in order to represent the values of being in Christ. And this is arguably the point of the Apostles' Creed and other catechisms teaching saints what they need to know in order to be responsible citizens of heaven. 
people who can celebrate and display the rule of Christ in a thousand earthly places. No other community is called to do that. And by the way, have you noticed that there is no particular line in the Apostles' Creed that touches on human identity or theological anthropology? Perhaps this article about the communion of saints, perhaps this is it. Because humans were always destined to be a chosen race, a kingdom of priests, a holy nation. And how God forms a people to be his treasured possession is arguably what the Bible from beginning to end is all about. Deeper than our class, ethnicity, or gender is the fact that we are members of this holy nation, men and women in Christ, fellow citizens in the communion of saints. That's our deepest identity. But what are citizens of heaven supposed to do? What's a holy nation for? To answer that, let me direct your attention to the next picture or series of pictures in verses 20 to 22. Paul here shifts from political to architectural and anatomical imagery. He pictures the saints as a dwelling place for God made up of living stones with Jesus himself being the cornerstone. But the whole edifice is a kind of organic temple. So maybe the church is a building after all, at least metaphorically. Calvin says each believer is a little temple, yet each individual temple forms part of the larger one. Now, of course, God doesn't need a literal dwelling, but he calls the church into being to be a place where his presence and activity will be on conspicuous display. Paul says in verse 7 that we've been made alive together in Christ so that in the coming ages, God might show the immeasurable riches of his grace. And Peter similarly says that God forms the church as a holy nation that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Again, this was always God's purpose in forming a holy nation. As he says in Isaiah 43, when he speaks of the people whom I formed for myself, that they may declare my praise. The people of God exist to praise God, yes, but their communion is itself a public demonstration of God's grace. Uh, Grant Osborne says that all of us who have been raised out of death to life in Christ are a show and tell to those around us, a show and tell of God's gracious mercy. And this suggests yet another image, number 99, Think of the church as a divine exhibit in the world's fair. A peopled place where God is pavilioned in splendor and girded with praise. Do you know about the world's fair? Uh, they still exist. There was supposed to be one this year, Expo 2020 in Dubai, but it got canceled like everything else in 2020. But a world's fair is a large international exhibition designed to showcase the achievements of the nations. The first World Expo was held in London's Crystal Palace in 1851 under a typically cumbersome Victorian name. The Great Ex Exhibition of the Works of Industry of All Nations. That's what was on display then. Chicago hosted a couple of world fairs in 1893 and again in 1934. And over the years, these world fairs have shifted their, in, uh, their emphasis. First, they wanted to showcase the industry of the nations, technological innovations and such. Then later, it became a means of cultural exchange. And now it seems to be a kind of opportunity for nation branding, <laughs> where each country's pavilion becomes part of a kind of advertising campaign, a competition for tourists and their money. Well, the church exhibits to the world 
the life and achievements of a holy nation, a way of life that is in but not of this world. Drawn from every tribe and nation, the church exhibits reconciliation in Christ. It exhibits a new multi-ethnic humanity where neither caste nor class count for anything, only membership in Christ's body. The church exhibits to the world the love of God, the peace of Christ, the fellowship of the Holy Spirit, riches all drawn from the treasury of a holy nation. So these are some of the images from Paul's gallery of ecclesiology that give flesh to our confession of the church as holy and Catholic. Workshop of a new humanity, time traveling witnesses to a once and future grace, fellow citizens of heaven, a holy nation pavilion in the world's fair. I think images matter. They orient our minds and hearts to what it means to be part of Christ's church. These pictures that Paul gives us should rule the church's social imaginary. These images should take every thought captive as we attempt to live out our citizenship each day. It helps me in my daily discipleship to remember that I'm a fellow citizen with others who've been made alive with Christ. I'm part of an ongoing living exhibit of a holy nation in the world's fair. That orients my day. In conclusion, let me suggest one last image of the church, just so we can make it an even 100. Picture the church as a living parable of the kingdom. Each time a church celebrates communion, each time we invite believers to the Lord's table, regardless of class or ethnicity, we perform the communion of saints. We exhibit the new humanity we have in Christ. His body becomes visible. Of course, as saints, we should be living out our citizenship of the gospel always, everywhere, and before everyone. You remember our Trinity Lago, the entrusted with the gospel. Well, the church is an integral part of the gospel. All these images describing the church, this is more central than the idea of going to heaven. To care about the integrity of the gospel then is to, carry about, is to care about the integrity of the church. Some of you may know the second century epistle to Diognetus and the way that it describes early Christians. Think, because Christians have been an exhibit in the world's fair since the book of Acts. But here's a portion from this epistle. Christians are indistinguishable from other men, either by nationality, language, or customs. They do not inhabit separate cities of their own or speak a strange dialect or follow some outlandish way of life. With regard to dress, food, and manner of life in general, they follow the customs whatever city they happen to be living in. And yet, there is something extraordinary about their lives. They live in their own countries as though they were only passing through. Any country can be their homeland, but for them, their homeland, wherever it may be, is a foreign country. They share their meals, but not their wives. They live in the flesh, but they are not governed by the desires of the flesh. They pass their days upon the earth, but they are citizens of heaven. I believe in the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, workshop of a new humanity, embassy from the future, the commonwealth of heaven existing and exhibited on earth for the sake of the world. Amen. Would you please stand for the benediction? Now go out as members of the company of saints, citizens of a holy nation, to do and be together living parables of the kingdom. And may the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen.
you are dismissed.